Father God, we thank you so much for all your love and grace, and we ask that you would put a hedge of protection around everyone that is here today, for those that are in the hospital, for those that are traveling to get here, we ask that you would just lift them up in a mighty way. Be with us as we go through this service and allow it to bring you honor and glory in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. I guess it's there. There it is. Hey, uh, you know, I, I really don't want you hurting yourself. I know you didn't bring your guitar, so I brought you something else to play. <laughs> You know, those, those tambourines might get away from you here. <laughs> but, and, you know, don't want you, you know, getting excited, <laughs> hurting yourself. Well, Jack is one of the few that have made it back from the hospital from those that have went recently. <laughs> he is young, yes. Uh, so remember, uh, Brother Wilbur, in your prayer and remember uh, Brother Graham in your prayer and uh, of course we still have uh, Jim and Nora that we need to lift up and we still have Patrick Papp and Ms. Cheryl that we need to lift up. So remember all of them. Remember our revivalists that are coming to uh, church. Remember them. They will be traveling. Some are uh, Rick is in uh, Kentucky and traveling in. Uh, he went to an Asbury conference there, so him and his wife are on the road. And uh, Brother Leo will be coming from Lufkin area tonight, and then Brother Gus from Shelbyville, so uh, on Tuesday night. So remember those folks and uh, invite all your friends. And uh, I heard that First Baptist doesn't even go to church on Sunday night, so invite all of First Baptist to come. Uh, they will enjoy every night. And uh, we'd love to have them share with us in this revival. Exercise class Monday and Thursday at 9. Online Bible study Tuesday night at 7. Wednesday morning Bible study at 10. We will not be meeting this week or we will be meeting. No? Okay. Prayer Shaw meeting group Wednesdays at 1. Family meal Wednesday night at 5.15. Uh, the the, the uh, meal is uh, King Ranch chicken. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they made Tell them this. Uh, I'm telling you, because they made tacos last week, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and so that's what we've decided. Okay. Are we, are we having that again, too? Oh, okay. Hey, last night we went to Red Bible. Huh? You gave us plan B. Oh, I gave us plan B. Eminem and Youth is also a Wednesday night at 6, and we are in, in a uh, confirmation class, but... You will learn more than just being in confirmation. So if you would like to come to that, it will be very informative for you. Uh, you will learn something, even if you have been through confirmation 30 times in your life, you will learn something. Uh, so I invite you to come. Charge conference will be Thursday, October 6th, unless that changes, which has changed about three times already, so you never know. Uh, at 7. So the 6th at 7. All right. Last night we went to Red Bible. They had their uh, fundraiser. And I won, thanks to, to uh, Miss Glenda uh, and her daughter, I won a butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the neatest thing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and she looked at me crazy like, why don't you put a ticket in there? it's a butterfly. You know? That's, that's one. Anyway, you know, we're supposed to be transformed into a new creation. And that's what this reminds me of. So, uh, anyway, that's why. But that's why. It's a sermon prop. 
<laughs> so, anything else that needs to come before the church this morning? All right, please make plans to attend the revival. You're really going to miss out if you're not here. Uh, tell all those that aren't here to get here. Because it is really going to be good. All right, let us sing.
salvation possible through his Son, our Lord and Savior. Because of God's love for us, we are God the best lives that he did. He should live as persons transformed by God's love instead of being conformed to the ways of the world. May our true worship of God be our daily lives.
Forgive us of our sins that you see value in us. Lord, we'd ask that you watch uh, over the ones that we've mentioned this morning by name, that you would watch over the nurses, the doctors, and the caregivers that are taking care of them too, Lord. That you would grant them strength, that you would grant them wisdom and understanding in these days where uh, they may not know uh, every fact that's surrounding their sickness. But well, Lord, you will provide. You are the great healer, and we have faith and confidence that you will restore their health. And Lord, we'd ask that you be with our nation, with our state, with our world, and the turmoil that we find ourselves in, Lord, that we would turn back to you and seek wisdom and understanding. Because power and prestige may come from the world, and we know that wisdom and understanding flow only from you. And that we as a sinful people would turn back to you and we would seek the, the guidance that we need to govern ourselves and to govern our entities that we have charge of. And Lord, we're thankful this morning that we have a revival coming up. And we pray that, uh, that the Holy Spirit would come into this church and would permeate throughout our town. That we would see a revival from the effects of the three speakers that are, that are coming. And Lord, we're thankful for Brother David Goodwin and his family that they've come to this church for a time such as this. And may you grant him, grant him wisdom as he guides this church, as he shepherds this church and its members in the coming days. All these things will ask in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray. Our Father, Lord, heaven. So somebody check that. I don't know if he's old enough to write the check. <laughs> All right. Are you old enough to have a bank account, sir? No. Hey, it's good to see you. How you doing? Let's pray. What a great representation of our younger kids today. Lord, we just thank you so much for these kids. And we lift them all up to you and ask that you would put your hand in protection on them, that you would guide their parents in raising them, that you would put a hedge of protection about them that would sustain them over the years as they learn more and more about you and as they grow up with you. We ask that you would just give them uh, insight today to the children's church and that you would lift the workers up and that you would give them peace in all that they do for our kids. In Christ's name, amen. Thanks, guys. Y'all follow up.
us pray. Father God, we ask you to take our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings, and that you would use them to further your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, and allow us to be the stewards of them that you've called us to be. In Christ's name.
scripture today comes from 2 Chronicles 6, 19a. For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the land for the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Um, you may be seated. Uh, so, Miss Mary, you just like sit there and beam and, and pride and say, that's my man. <laughs> I, I do pray for his fingers, his brain, his heart, for the all four days. <laughs> Mary's heard him enough times. She heard him. Boy, he screwed up face, too. <laughs> I doubt it. I bet she's over there just beaming. Boy, I'm glad I married him. <laughs>
However, ag teachers work more than preachers do, so I feel sorry for every ag teacher. Uh, and probably band directors too, they say. Uh, but, uh, but, but, because you just put in so much time. But there I was uh, teaching ag, and, and they were going to move me at the end of that year from the church I was serving to another church. And, you know, I figured, well, you don't go into a new church and then buy a car. Right? Because then it looks like they're paying you too much. <laughs> right? And, and you don't, you don't want to buy a car before you leave a church because you, they think, well, you're not paying them enough. You know, they're, they're getting a new job, so they got to get a new car. Well, you do it right in that sweet spot in between those two is what I thought. And so I had a new truck. I'd only had it for a year, and it was new to me. It wasn't new to me, but it was new to me. And uh, it, it, it had like 100,000 miles on it. And, uh, and I'd had it about a year, like I said. And, and so I said, well, you know, I really do need to get a new truck. And one of my church members drove up in this nice brand new truck. And I said, man, I like the truck. He said, yeah, I got it from so-and-so. I said, well, where's he at? He's, he's in Comanche, <coughs> Texas. I'm like, Comanche, Texas, where is that? <laughs> he said, I tell you what. I, I said, well, I'd like to trade mine in. He said, I tell you what, call my guy. So I did. I called him. And we, I looked online at what they had, you know, and, I, and I'm getting ready for this move, and it's at the end of the school year. And... Uh, so I said, well, I like this blue and gray cowboy color Ford. You know, crew cab, all the bells and whistles. And so I call this guy up and he's like, well, yeah, we can get you in a new Well, no, we can't get you in a new truck. I said, okay, no problem. So I spent about two days with this guy uh, trying to get something, you know, and just wasn't quite there. Just what didn't have enough credit, didn't have enough money, didn't have enough whatever to get it. And uh, and so uh, we decided that we're done. Well, that night I'm dreaming about that truck. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, you idiot, talking to yourself. You can't have that truck. And so. In my dream, the Lord's opening the door for me, and he's saying, here it is. Here's your new truck. And I'm like, Lord, stop. <laughs> Don't do that. I, I, you already told me I've been happy. I'm good with what I have. I am satisfied. I am content. I like my truck. Don't, get, don't act like I can have this one. And he's like, but it's yours. And I'm like, Lord, stop. Don't let me dream this. You know? Well, I get to school the next morning. And my phone rings. And it's this guy from Comanche, Texas. And he says, you ain't going to believe this, Mr. Goodwin. I said, what? He said, in the middle of the night, Ford, Ford. <laughs> Drop the interest on all used vehicles to 1.9%, and we can get you in there with nothing down. <laughs> I said, don't play with me. <laughs> you know? He says, as a matter of fact, all you've got to do is empty your truck, and uh, we'll, we'll deliver it to you, and we'll pick yours up and drive it back. I said, do what? <laughs> You're going to deliver me a new truck. Now, this wasn't a brand new. It was it had 36,000 miles on it. But it was pretty new, you know? I mean, it's just broke in 36,000 miles. You hear that from every cell phone, right? It's just broke in 36,000 miles. So the Lord gives me that new truck. And I love that. I loved it for as long as I drove it. 
And he gave me another. But what I, my point is, is yes, the Lord is going to give to you more than you can give to him. Whether it be your whole life, whether it be your finances, whether it be your children, whether it be your friends and family. The Bible says, bind up on earth what you want to bind in heaven. Now, I don't plan on taking my truck to heaven. But I do plan on taking the relationship I have with God that says, give it all and he'll give it back to heaven. Okay? So I want y'all to uh, think about that as, as we go through here. And I want you to see how important it is that we give to God. Um, and I don't want you to necessarily think about money. While it is kind of about money and, and of course, everything in our country is uh, about money, it seems. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's our biggest downfall money in our country. Um, think of it not about money, but about support of what God is doing in your life and in the lives of those around you. Okay, remember a year while back I said, don't look for the money, look for the need. All right, so uh, if, if you say, well, what does that mean? I'm going to tell you. If you have an electric bill that needs to be paid and it's $300, don't pray, Lord, give me $300. Pray, Lord, I need to pay my electric bill so that you will be glorified in me paying my bills. Should all been writing that down. Okay. Pray for the need. Say, Lord, I... The Lord wants you to pay your bills. He's not honored if you're a non-bill paying Christian. Now, are there times we can't pay our bills? Sure there are. You know? Why? Because the Lord wants you to lean on him. I told some folks this week, we can't even breathe without God. So if we can't breathe without God, why do we think we can do anything else without Him? <clears throat> Look at Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 or 12. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Can we say that in our country? Yes. Return to me and I will return to you. So if you're sitting there today and you say, well, you know, my relationship with God is, is not what it should be or not what it could be or not where I think God wants it to be or even not where I want it to be. Then return to God, and he says he will return to you. You say, well, I don't, you know, when, when I was homeless and, and down and out, I, I was crying a lot, and I would pray to the Lord, you know, but I felt like my prayers were stopping at the top of the truck, because I was living in the truck, and, and it, they were falling right back on me. And I thought, well, Lord, don't if you not even listen to me, I mean, they're not even leaving this truck. You know, well, I wasn't where I was supposed to be God. He never stopped talking to me. You know what he said? Keep reading my word and keep praying for me. And I was like, what for? They're just dropping, you know, what for? Return to me. But you ask, how are we to return? <clears throat> Will a mere mortal rob God? Now think about that. You live in the greatest country in the world. 
where everything is provided for you, even if you're homeless. And I know because I've been homeless. I got $20 a week in food stamps when I was homeless. You say, well, that's not very much. Bologna and bread go a long way. Okay? Will, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Let me tell you, folks, in our country, we are robbing God of time, praise, and glory. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Listen to this right here. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your field will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. He says, test him in this. Test given to God. Test it. Do you know we're not supposed to test God, are we? But here's the one case where God says, test me in this, and I will open the storehouse and pour out on you more than you can handle. More than you deserve. I had a friend one time in uh, old cow hand, and uh, every time I, I'd say, how you doing? He'd say, better not deserve, brother Dave. <coughs> and then he was, you know. He had, a, he had a mansion on the hill. It was a double wide, but it was a mansion on the hill, you know. <laughs> and he had cows all around him. Yeah, big old tall, lanky fella. You know, he can we were out visiting on horseback one time. He and I, we were out, you know, witnessing, trying to get people to church. We got close to his driveway, was going to hit one more house, and his horse that I was on was so tired of this fat boy being on it that he tried to run up the driveway. <laughs> it was terrible. Test me in this. As God's people, we are not to test God, yet this one verse we have God telling us to test him. That one thing to give him what he deserves. We're hearing this in God's testimony, the Old Testament, God's testimony. He tells us to test him in all that he deserves. Give him all that he deserves. And he promises he will give more to us out of the treasures of heaven. Paul states it like this in God's New Testimony, which is the New Testament. There is no, 2 Corinthians 9, there is no need for me to write to you about the service to the saints, for I know your eagerness to help. I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them that since last year you in Acadia were ready to give. And your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. In other words, what we do here is going to stir others to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but, they, but that you may be ready, as I said, you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, <coughs> We, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge you brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you have promised. Then it will be ready as a generous gift. Not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also read generously. Now, is, is he talking about tithes and offerings? Or is he talking about giving to the ministry? 
He's talking about giving everything, right? But it, it specifically, he's talking about, all right, you, you promised to give to the ministry here. And so if you, if you sow sparingly and don't fulfill your obligation, then you're going to reap sparingly. But if you fulfill your obligation, sow all that you proclaim, you're going to reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God decided, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's hard to be a cheerful giver if all you ever hear is give, give, give. You know, it's like, well, all he ever talks about is giving. You know, we built this building that wasn't good enough for him. Now he wants another building. All he ever talks about is give, 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 give. Right? Give. Don't be a taker, be a giver. Did you know we're raising a generation of takers? Yes. We'll get to that in a minute. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Will, <clears throat> will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Of your righteousness, of your goodness, of what God is in you. <coughs> you will be made rich in every way so that you can give can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This is service that you perform is not supplying the needs of God's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of the service by which you have proved yourselves. Men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. And in prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. <clears throat> we might say that these two giving scenarios are of different contexts. In the one, we have God being given to sacrificially in an offering. In this one of Paul, we have a ministry being met across the world. While they are indeed two different contexts, they are both served by the same heart. And ultimately for the same purpose, which is to add to God's kingdom. Folks, you did not build this building just so that you would be happy in your nice little air-conditioned place. The reason you are here is for the worship of God, the edifying of your souls, the continually learning of that relationship. You say, well, I don't have that relationship yet. Well, that's why you're here. Because you need that relationship, that relationship that teaches you to be able to give your life to God completely. Completely. You know, I would take 10 brand new Christians who are willing to give their life totally to God over 100 crusty old Christians who forgot what it was all about. A 
a lot of times with my uh, other denominational friends, I say, well, I'll put 10, 10 of my salvation folks that have come to know the Lord up to 100 of your feet. And they'll say, well, why? I say, because I know why they're saved, how they're saved, and what it means. They didn't get scared to get there. You know what? We can scare people to the cross all day long, but if that's all we had, there's no relationship in there. And my God wants a relationship with you. A relationship that is your all to him. So what about the old excuse? God doesn't need my money. right. God doesn't need your money. He needs your total sacrifice. He needs your all. If you expect him to give his all to you, he expects you to give your all to him. No, he doesn't need money. I have seen money come from the strangest of, of ways. When uh, when uh, uh, Wells was going through uh, their uh, they, they tore down the parsonage and built the highway through there we asked them for a hundred and seventy thousand dollars. That's what it was going to cost us to tear down our old parsonage and build a new one. That's all we asked for. They said, well, that's too much. Well, we didn't know how they figured that. Because we showed them the plans of the new parsonage. And we didn't build outrageously above. I mean, we didn't even put carpet in. It was all concrete floor. So we didn't know what they were talking about. How's that too much? Said, so we'll see you in court. So we went to court. The judges, there were several of them from all over the state, said, we think y'all need to give them 296 something thousand dollars. It's almost double what we asked for. They had the audacity to call me that afternoon and say, would y'all be willing to take that 170 you asked for? <laughs> I said, no, we wouldn't. And that's F-A-L-B-E-Y, United Methodist Church, on the chair. We had spent months dealing with them, and they wanted, are you kidding me? No, God gave a whole much more, right? We only asked for what we needed, but God knows what we need, right? So I, I've just seen crazy things happen. So what about the excuse? Well, God doesn't need our money. Acts 4, starting in verse 32. All the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. All right, that's the new church, okay? So in the Old Testament, we gave 10%, right? In the New Testament, oh, and there was more, we, we always say that, but there was actually more offerings that you did at certain times of the year. There was much more than 10% given. 10% was a, a, a standard along the way, but there were other offerings. In Acts, the church came together and knew and said, look, it's all, it's all God's. You know, I got a can of peaches. Do you want some? So that nobody does without peaches. You see what I'm saying? Everything was shared in common. Is what the Bible says. 
So the new giving is our is our all. And God's grace, with great power, apostles continue to testify the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine coming to church and nobody needs anything? For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Yes. So a field. Yep. I'm getting there. So a field, he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Going into chapter 5. Now, a man named Ananias, together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself. He brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? In other words, you didn't have to give it to the Lord. But you were going to give it to the Lord. That's why you sold it. That's why he helped you sell it. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to just human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down dead. What was he killed for? For lying to God. He had set one price in his heart and gave another, and God killed him, graveyard dead. You don't think God takes this serious? God takes it serious. When you say, God, my all is your all, he takes that serious. He don't want you holding back. A lot of times we say, Well, Lord, uh, you know, I'll go with you this far. But, ooh, I don't want to give everything I am up to you. Then some of the men, young men came wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the Spirit of the Lord. Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. What we learn here is God wants our whole being. Another proof of being a rich young man. What did he tell you? What did he ask Jesus? How can I be saved? What did Jesus tell him? Go sell everything you got. Give it to the poor and come follow me. Wow, I'm giving all up for it. Of all the preaching I could do about giving. There was a lady that taught me about giving. She was about this big. She's a little black lady. She was real skinny. Looked like she was on all kind of drugs. She'd come up with the Katrina tobacco leaves and uh, was in a little nursing home that we had converted into a, a makeshift shelter for them. And uh, so one Sunday morning before church, I had some time, so I drove out there and said, hey, just want to invite y'all to church. If you need anything, let me know. This lady says to me, can I talk to you? And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I don't have time to deal with this. You know, because what does she want, right? She probably wants some money to go buy some drugs. Because that's what she looked like. And then here I am, I'm just judging her up one side and down the other. Just 
the best Christian you can be in that moment. <laughs> and so I said, well, sure. And I step off to the side with her. We step into the dining room and she pulls some money out of her pocket and she says, can I tithe to your church because mine's in Louisiana and it's underwater? She said, the FEMA check came yesterday and this is my tithe from it. And I expected like two or three dollars, right? So I'm thinking, if I'm down and out, God, I'll catch you later. I'll catch up when I get back on my feet, right? But here she was. She got a $400 FEMA check, and she gave me $40. Well, if all you have to your name is $400, $40 is a lot of money. And so as the Lord shortened my height, <laughs> down to about nothing I said I'd be glad to and as I'm walking out two other ladies come running down the hall pastor, pastor, we need to talk to you about our tithe and so I asked the two ladies over and I said are you wanting to tithe to my church today? And they said, yes, sir, that's what we'd like to do. And I said, I'm going to tell you what you need to do. I said, there's going to be two other pastors here this afternoon. I would like for you each to, to tithe to one of their churches so that they can have the same story that I have. Folks, I judged that lady hard. I thought no good would come from this lady. And she taught me about tithing. She taught me to give even when you don't have it. She taught me to give of yourself no matter what. That was an amazing <coughs> story. How often do we judge the need of the church or God's ministry and we question what God is asking us to do Instead of just being obedient and doing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand and sing the way of the cross. If you need to come forward, I invite you to do so. If you need to join this church. We invite you to do so if you need to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior today so that you can have a relationship that gives you everything and costs you all. You can.
wondrously bless you, may he watch over you, may his countenance shine upon you, and better yet, may you shine to a hurting world around you. In the name of the Father, and